Good morning folks and welcome to our service here at Nairn Free Church for Sunday the 19th of December. Uh, we do welcome you in Jesus' name and our prayer is that he will be with us and that he will bless us as we uh, gather around his word. Uh, we're going to begin by singing Once in Royal David's City Stood a Lowly Cattle Shed where a mother laid a baby in a manger for his bed. And of course Mary was that mother mild and Jesus Christ her little child. Uh, singing along here with folks at Middlesbrough Baptist Church, we sing to God's praise. It's nice to be able to begin our service with a familiar Christmas carol. Uh, those of us who are able to be in church tomorrow, um, we hope to have what we call a Christmas family service. And uh, it'll be slightly different from this video version, um, but essentially it's the same message. And uh, the, the, the things that it's possible to do in church, we can't do here from the house. Um, but... For those of you that are only able to watch on video, um, you're not missing anything much. It's it's, it's essentially the same message. Um, we're going to turn to God now in prayer. Let's pray. O oh Lord God, our Heavenly Father, 
the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God who gave his Son, the, the Son who was obedient to the Father, the one who, who loved us, who came and gave himself for us. Lord, we, we praise and bless you. We can never grasp the full wonder of the incarnation of Jesus Christ, that the eternal God should take on himself human flesh and become one of us. We can never grasp the wonder of that. All the other miracles that are recorded for us, both in the story of Jesus' birth and in his ongoing life, they, they all make sense when we remember that it is God the Son, the eternal Son, who has come into the world, and therefore nothing is impossible. And we pray, enable us to, to bow down with reverence and with thanksgiving, even as we come to consider these uh, old stories. We, we've heard them so often, and we pray that they never become so familiar that we don't pay heed to them. Uh, but we do bless you that we can think again about the wonder of Christ's birth, that he came into the world, the, the Son of God, becoming the Son of Man, in order that the sons of men might become the sons of God. We pray, uh, teach us to uh, worship him, help us to, to be like the shepherds uh, who, who rushed down to Bethlehem with haste to meet Jesus. May we have that same spirit as they did, that we must find out what the Lord is doing, must uh, see how we can be blessed through this, must meet with Christ. Lord, we pray that we would be of that same spirit. We pray we'd be of the same spirit as the, the wise men uh, who travelled far and wide and long in order to meet Jesus. Blessed, may we be blessed with that same wisdom, that longing desire to see uh, the Christ of God, to know him, to worship him like they were. Our gracious God, we pray, uh, help us to, to learn even from these so-called Christmas stories, stories that are just as appropriate in the middle of July as they are in the middle of December. Lord, we pray, uh, deliver us from bracketing any part of the gospel into one season or another. But we know that uh, culturally there is this focus at this time and we, we thank you that uh, for even a moment uh, there's a sense in which even the eyes of the world are turned toward Bethlehem. There's so much that drowns us out too, so much of our cultural Christmas, uh, so much of the what's going on around us politically and uh, pandemically. Lord, so many of these things, so much um, materialism and focus on money and presents and gifts, uh, so much uh, that is just over the top. But we thank you that at the very centre of it, for those who are able to see, there is the story of the one who, though he was rich, yet he became poor in order that we who were poor might become rich. We pray that you would enable us to focus on the Lord Jesus Christ, to seek uh, his blessing, and to long to know him, to know him for ourselves, not to be content uh, to think of ourselves in a Christian nation or any such thing. That is mere delusion. Uh, Lord, we pray that our relationship with Jesus would be personal and would be vital and would be uh, the thing that is at the very heart and core of our being so that we know what it is to be able to embrace him as our saviour and not simply look on him in some general sense as the saviour of the world but to seek him as our very own saviour the one who saves us from our sins gracious God we pray enable us to know Christ enable us to speak of Christ to preach him to teach him to talk of him to live him out to live in such a way as is honouring and pleasing to him and that even at this time you would speak to uh, people who don't know him and bring them to know him. Lord, in as much as uh, folk may be more attuned to the things of God at this time, we pray that your spirit would be at work, uh, truly blessing people and truly bringing them to that saving knowledge of Jesus, which is the only thing that matters in life or in death. May your grace be upon us and especially upon those we know who are uh, suffering and uh, undergoing trials and difficulties of one kind or another at this time. Lord, we, we are mindful of the sick and the bereaved. We are mindful 
of uh, those who are separated from loved ones. We're, we're mindful of any who are forced to be housebound or hospitalised. Lord, there are many folks on our hearts. We pray for them all and ask that uh, your grace would be with them and that they would have that same sense of blessing uh, where they are as we do when we are able to gather together. May your grace be upon us and take away every sin. For we ask everything in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, we're going to read God's word now as we find it in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, both our readings today are from the Gospel of Luke. Um, and this first one is chapter 1 and verses 26 to 38. Um, it's the story of Mary being visited by the angel Gabriel. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favoured one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of David forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Amen. Well, that, of course, is a very beloved part of what we call the traditional Christmas story. And uh, we all love the Christmas story. I presume if you're tuning in today, it's because uh, you love the Christmas story. Uh, but even many people who wouldn't call themselves uh, Christian, um, maybe wouldn't even call themselves religious, even they like the story, love it, some of them. Um, not everybody, of course, but, but many people do, even folk that are uh, decidedly anti-religious and anti-Christian uh, will enjoy aspects, perhaps cultural aspects of Christmas, spending time with family, having holidays from school or from work or whatever, giving out um, presents, parties in, in normal times, of course, um, being able to relax in front of the TV children around, visiting relatives and friends, you know, whatever. Uh, there's so many cultural aspects of Christmas too that uh, folk just enjoy. And for, for genuine believers and people who, who really do love the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, all of the above are still applicable. Um, but on top of that, the, the main thing, of course, is the, the annual reminder of the birth of Jesus, the, the most uh, amazing thing has happened, that the Son of God has come into the world, has become a human being, has taken on flesh, and some 33 years later will even go to the length of dying uh, in order that sinful man might be saved. Um, so we, we celebrate the birth of Jesus and we see in it the, the love of God uh, for a sinful lost race, that love that will culminate on the cross at Calvary. And it's the story, the, the human story of the, the beginning of the human life, of the greatest life ever lived, of the greatest story ever told. He's a real person, a real person who stepped into history. He's the baby in the manger. He grows up to be the saviour of the world. Um, and this, these things are events that happened genuinely in human history. Now, for some people, that, that side doesn't matter. They don't care 
uh, whether the story is true or not. They think it's uh, well, it's symbolic. It, it, it's comforting. It's a, it's a nice story, and we don't really care whether it happened or not. Whether these biblical folk existed or whether they they didn't it makes no difference because it's a it's a nice story and it gives a sense of hope and peace and optimism in the world and whether there really was a baby Jesus or a Mary and a Joseph or the shepherds or the wise men or the innkeeper or whoever for some people it doesn't matter any more than Santa Claus uh, we're going to argue about Santa uh, for some people it's on the same the same level but for Christians it matters very much it matters everything about it matters otherwise if, if if this story is not true, if it's not historically true, then we who call ourselves Christian are, are living lives based on a lie, based on a deception, based on foolish, wishful thinking of a different world from the reality of the one that we face. Um, it means that I'm, I'm deluded, I'm wasting my life uh, being a preacher of the gospel. If I'm telling a story that isn't true and is, is just meant to to hold our hand and help us to, to get through life and cope with life a little better. And and all Christian people uh, who claim to believe this story is true, if, if it's not, then they are wasting their lives, uh, committing, dedicating their lives to a, a lie, a, a worst, a, a fantasy, a dream at best. Um, there are those that would say, Religious people just use religion as a crutch, as a prop. It's a cushion from reality. It's a, a drug. It's a way of escape. It's just a way of avoiding the, the harsh reality that this life is short and brutal and um, and it's over in a flash and there's nothing else to it. Um, th there are those that would say that and would tell us that we are wasting our time. But I often think, you know, if, if the church was just a, a human construct, if the whole Christian faith was just a human construct, it would surely have died out centuries ago. Um, it's so fallible, it's so weak, it's so frail, that if it's just a human institution, there's no way it could have lasted. And there's still folk, of course, that predict it's not going to last. It, it, it will uh, die soon. It's dying anyway. It's not what it once was. And it's, it's about to go the way of the dodo. You'll always find folk that say that. Um, but the question I want to pose today really is, but is it true? Is it true? Is the Christian message real? Is it true or is it false? Is Christmas message true? Is Jesus true? Was there really a Jesus? Did, he, did such a person exist? If he did, did he die on a cross in Jerusalem? Did he rise from the dead? which is the central claim of the Christian faith, far more important than his birth at Bethlehem, is his death at Jerusalem. Though the, the death couldn't have occurred without the birth, so they're both important in their own way, but you, you know what I'm saying. Um, is the second coming true or false? Is the Bible true or false? Is, is God true or false? These are the questions that folk uh, raise and ask and ponder about. And it's worth reflecting that um, supposing everybody in the world believed that it was true, that doesn't mean that it is true. Supposing everybody in the world believed that it was false, that doesn't mean that it is false. So it, we're not, it's not based on uh, numbers alone. It's, the question really is, is there credible grounds for believing it? Christians do believe that it's true and they've staked their lives on it, they've staked their very souls on it. They've staked the, the fact that they believe they're going to live forever. They've staked that on it and it shapes the way they live this life. So is it true or if it, or is it not? And if it is, then how does that affect our lives? How ought we to, to live? I think just asking these questions is forcing us to ask what God wants from us and how he wants us to live. And it, it sometimes surprises folk uh, if they're not so familiar with the Gospels. They, they might know that there are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. These are four different writers who have penned biographies of Jesus. It sometimes surprises people to, to know that only Matthew and Luke ever even mention the circumstances around Jesus' birth. Mark makes no mention of it at all. John makes no mention of it at all. 
only Mark and Luke uh, tell us what we, uh, sorry, Matthew and Luke tell us what we are calling here the, the Christmas story. Who were these men? Well, Matthew was one of Jesus' 12 disciples. Uh, he was a tax collector, um, despised outcast in his own society uh, because he worked for the Romans. It was seen as being traitorous, taking taxes from Jews to pay uh, for the, the Roman uh, occupiers of their land. Um, but he gave it up in a moment. He gave it up. Jesus called him, come and follow me. And Matthew just got up, left everything behind and became a follower of Jesus. And it's him that writes the, what we call the Gospel of Matthew. He obviously knew Jesus firsthand, spent years uh, living alongside him and knew very well uh, all these stories and the things that he writes about in his Gospel. Luke, on the other hand, very probably never even met Jesus. Luke was a doctor. Uh, we know from um, elsewhere in the scriptures, probably he's not even a Jew, he's a Gentile who's been brought in. Tradition would tell us that he came either from Antioch in Syria or Philippi in Greece. Uh, so he's a complete outsider. He's, he's not one of the, the Hebrew Jewish people at all. Uh, so how does he come to be writing a biography of Jesus and why should we trust that what he says is true when in all likelihood he never even met him? Well, he tells us himself. The, the way Luke's gospel begins is different from the way any of the other gospels begins. And he tells us how he came to write this story. And after we've sung again, we'll come back and see what Luke had to say about how his gospel, his biography of Jesus came together. But first we're going to sing together, we're going to sing Silent Night, Holy Night, All is Calm, All is Quiet. Uh, we'll sing to God's praise along with folks at Grace Community Church in Los Angeles, California. We sing to God's praise.
Well, we come to our second reading, uh, also from the Gospel of Luke. So bear in mind, this is written by Dr. Luke, the Gentile, who never met Jesus. Uh, he's telling us uh, about the actual circumstances around the birth of Jesus. So this is chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, uh, verses 1 to 21. In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the same that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all those things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told them. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Amen. Well, that brings us to the end of our service again. Once again, we thank you for uh, tuning in and uh, we look forward to sharing fellowship with you again in the future as the Lord enables us. Uh, just a couple of things to finish um, to remind you that, of course, there are Sunday services on as usual over the next couple of weeks, but also on Saturday, the 1st of January, there'll be a New Year's Day service in the church at 11am. So if you're able to join us for that, that would be terrific. Um, and I did mention just at the end of the service there about the Christianity Explored course. Um, if you're interested in knowing more about that, do get in touch with us. Um, we hope to run it the next time on Wednesday mornings, um, around about roughly 10 till 11. It's a series of seven weeks. Um, if you can join us for that, great. If you'd like to do the course, but that time slot doesn't suit, then uh, we just arrange it for a time that does and uh, just come back to us about that and we'll find something that works for you. I think these are all the things, just the other notices will appear as usual at the end of the service. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. Well, we come back then to, to Luke, just at the way Luke begins his gospel, because it's, it's a very intriguing beginning he has to his story of Jesus, uh, very different from the other Gospels. And uh, he's basically, he's writing to somebody called Theophilus. We don't know who Theophilus is, but he's obviously somebody who's either already a Christian or somebody who's asking questions about Christianity and wanting to know more. And um, Luke seems to be writing in the first place to persuade him about the Christian faith. And he describes in this first four verses of his gospel how he comes to be writing. And he says this, in as much as many have undertaken, so he's not the only one he's saying, many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished amongst us, 
in other words, the things about Jesus. Many folk have sat down to write that. Just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. In other words, we've been listening to these folk, eyewitnesses, uh, preachers of the gospel. We've been listening to what they said. And Luke says, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. So Luke is telling us uh, why he's writing this, who he's writing it for. And there's a sense in which we're all Theophilus because we're all going to read his book and see what he's got to say about Jesus. And he's told us there that the reason he's doing it and the reason he's gone to all these pains to find out whether these things are right is so that uh, Theophilus can have certainty about the things he has been taught. And that's our hope too, as we come to read it, that we too can have certainty based on what Luke has found out. So it's interesting in, in the context of the fact that an angel appears to Mary, uh, Joseph has a dream in which um, an angel speaks to him also. Uh, the shepherds are visited by an angel, the wise men are guided by a star. Uh, there are all these supernatural things going on um, by which people learn about the birth of Jesus. But Luke doesn't claim any such thing for himself. He, he never says, uh, I wanted to write the story of Jesus and an angel appeared to me in a dream one night and told me what to write. There's nothing like that. He doesn't claim an angel. He doesn't claim a miracle. He doesn't claim a vision, a revelation, a dream. He doesn't claim any of these things. Think rather of somebody like a, a TV reporter. Uh, the kind of folk, we're, we're watching the news and they say we're now going over to our correspondent in wherever, the Middle East or somewhere. Um, to tell us about a story that is unfolding over there. And the reporter has gone to that place and he's trying to get to the bottom of the story, he's trying to get to the truth of the story, so he maybe reads up on it, uh, he goes to the location, he checks the whatever he thinks he knows, he goes and then speaks to people, interviews people, goes to places, uh, takes pictures, the camera uh, follows what they're talking about, he asks questions, it doesn't just ask like the first person he sees, but he asks people that might be in the know, checks it again against somebody else. Is that person right or is there another side to this story? And he's doing all those things um, and trying to, trying to get to the truth of the story. Um, and Luke is like one of those correspondents, one of those reporters. He too has gone to the effort of speaking to eyewitnesses. He's gone, he's spoken to preachers of the word, people who have uh, committed their lives to following Jesus. He's asking them, well, what's motivated you? Why do you do this? What do you know about Jesus? What can you tell me? Um, and he's putting all this stuff together. He listens closely. He listens with discernment, exercises judgment. He studies, he researches, he consults, he concludes. And once he's, only when he's done all that, does he compile this narrative about Jesus that we now know as the Gospel of Luke. He's not just accepting uh, the first person he's, he comes across um, and what might be a wild story, uh, but he tells us, I've carefully investigated and evaluated and chosen the material that tells me about the life of this man, Jesus. Who did he speak to? Well, we, we don't know exactly. It's very possible he spoke to Mary. There's a couple of references about Mary where we read things like we had in our reading there. She treasured up all these things in her heart. And it's very possible that she herself was the one that told Luke that, that um, you know, all the things that happened, I kept such a careful memory of them because they were so important to me. It could be that he met Jesus' family, um, his brothers, his sisters, his cousins. He might have met the families of the shepherds. Luke's probably writing 30, 40 years after the birth of Jesus. Um, so maybe the shepherds are long gone, but the families might still be around with what happened to their dads. Um, he, he probably went to Nazareth and interviewed the people there. He would have met those disciples that were still living, uh, people that had followed Jesus around, people that had listened to his teaching, people who had experienced healings, uh, people who had been in the crowds when Jesus did things or spoke things. Uh, he may have met the soldiers who were at the cross. 
Paul tells us in one place, talking about the resurrected Christ, that uh, Jesus appeared at one time to more than 500 people all at the same time. Luke may have found some of these people and learned from them their first-hand experience of the resurrected Christ. The point is he's gone around, he's interviewed, he's researched, he's asked questions in order to get to the truth of the story. And he's written what he calls an orderly account. It's what I've written for you, most excellent Theophilus. Um, maybe other folk he felt had, had written a bit of a, a ramble. Um, that's not Luke. He, he's structured his sentences, he's structured his stories in such a way that uh, Theophilus can read this and come to his own conclusions, um, either to assure him in his faith or to persuade him to come to faith in Christ. Luke can't make Theophilus believe, he can't make anybody believe, neither can any of us. But Luke simply sets out the facts as he has found them. Um, and he knows that Theophilus can go and double check and cross reference anything if he wants to do that. And where we can check Luke on a historical basis, we find he's really accurate. So just a couple of examples at the beginning of chapter two. Um, he talks about in the reign of Caesar Augustus, the registration that happened, the census when Quirinius was the governor of Syria, or at the beginning of chapter three. He sets it all in an even broader context. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, and so on. And he, he sets it in an exact historical context, which as far as we can tell, is uh, consistent with what other historians tell us of the same period. So where Luke can be checked historically, we find it all adds up. And we can have the same confidence that Theophilus had, that Luke had looked into all this really carefully and drawn his conclusions before writing his story. He had made sure that these things were the truth. They weren't philosophy, it wasn't um, wordiness, it wasn't speculation. It was genuine historical facts designed to help Theophilus in his faith. And in that sense, you and I are Theophilus and Luke has written so that you and I can believe the same things that Theophilus was being encouraged to believe because Luke is telling us, I've looked into it all. And this is what I've discovered. When John comes to write his gospel, uh, he will say something similar towards the end. I've written these things so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So you can know that these things are true. That would be our hope and our prayer for everybody who's listening, that people would come to know that the, the historic person of Jesus, this is his story and it's true. It's historically true. And we can have hope, we can have faith, we can have confidence and belief in it. Nobody seriously questions the historical existence of Jesus, uh, even amongst um, atheists and agnostics. Um, there's very few that would dare to question whether or not he was a historical figure. They might question things that were said about him, but not his historicity. Very rarely does that happen. But across the world and across the centuries, millions of people have come to believe in this Jesus. Perhaps billions, I, the, the day will declare it, how many believe. Uh, and have trusted in this Jesus, who they've only read about, through people like Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, trusted in him for salvation and for the forgiveness of sins because they're convinced that these things are true. I'm convinced they're true. I hope you're convinced they're true and that salvation is to be found in the Lord Jesus Christ. And still, and this often comes as a surprise to people, uh, depending on where they're coming from, still the church is growing. Around the world, the church is still growing, growing every day. Thousands of people every day. Something like 10 to 11 million people are added to the Christian church uh, every year. It's an extraordinary story of growth. We don't see so much of it in our own land, sadly. Uh, sometimes things here look as if they are in decline. They, they certainly are compared to where we've once been. But in China, folk are coming to Christ in their thousands. Um, Africa, South America, there are amazing stories coming out of these places. That places that are way way beyond the, the gospel, the, the imagination of even the gospel writers like Luke, who would never have heard of some of these places. The gospel has gone to folk that were complete outsiders at that time, racially outside, ethnically outside. 
no matter the gender, no matter the riches or poor, the gospel goes all around the world. There are amazing stories coming out of Iran. There are stories coming out of Thailand. Um, what was I reading here? That uh, in Thailand, on one day, uh, let me see, on one day, 6th of September 2020, 1,435 new believers were baptised on one day in Thailand, the most ever known in Thai history, um, in a hardline Islamic country like Iran. It's believed there's probably over now a million believers uh, there, Christians. The Bible societies are printing amazing statistics here. In the last five years, um, 1.8 billion Bibles, New Testaments and Scripture portions have been provided around the world. A quarter of the Bibles distributed in 2019 were downloaded uh, electronically. Um, by far the largest share was in Latin America. Since 2015, there have been 68 million Bibles, 5 million New Testaments and almost 1.5 billion portions of Scripture shared in that region, uh, Central and South America. The Bible Society of Brazil provides more scripture than any other in the world. The printing press at Bowden in Sao Paulo produced 23,000 copies of the Bible per day in 2019. Such was the demand. Why is that? that, that there's, there's no fantasy on earth can produce those kinds of statistics. Is this true? Yes, it's true. I believe it's true. I hope you believe it's true. If you don't believe it's true yet, I hope you come to believe it's true. Um, if you do want to ask more questions, if you live locally, then we hope to have a Christianity Explored course starting in the new year. Come along, learn about the Christian faith, discuss, ask questions, do what Luke did. Investigate for yourself. That's what it's all about. Um, is it too good to be true? No, it's not. It's 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 wonderfully brilliant that it is true. It's wonderfully brilliant. And that's why we, as a church, are happy to celebrate the coming of Christ into the world. Because it's not just a story. Yes, it's a story. But is it true? 100%. I believe it is. May God bless us all that we come to know Jesus for ourselves. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful story of Christ and pray that we might uh, grow to know him more and the more we know him, the more we love him and we come to embrace him as the true saviour, our own true saviour. We ask everything in his name and for his sake. Amen. Our closing praise is Heart the Herald Angels Sing, Glory to the Newborn King. And we're singing along here with folks, sorry, just fumbling for my notes. Uh, Westgate, no, no, it's not. It's uh, the Royal Albert Hall in London. We sing to God's praise.
Well, that brings us to the end of our service again. Once again, we thank you for uh, tuning in and uh, we look forward to sharing fellowship with you again in the future as the Lord enables us. Uh, just a couple of things to finish and um, to remind you that, of course, there are Sunday services on as usual over the next couple of weeks, but also on Saturday, the 1st of January, there'll be a New Year's Day service in the church at 11am. So if you're able to join us for that, that would be terrific. Um, and I did mention just at the end of the service there about the Christianity Explored course. Um, if you're interested in knowing more about that, do get in touch with us. Um, we hope to run it the next time on Wednesday mornings, um, around about roughly 10 till 11. It's a series of seven weeks. Um, if you can join us for that, great. If you'd like to do the course, but that time slot doesn't suit, then uh, we just arrange it for a time that does and uh, just come back to us about that and we'll find something that works for you. I think these are all the things, just the other notices will appear as usual at the end of the service. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. <laughs>